there's more to life. And that is absolutely true. There's so much more to life. And life without Christ is meaningless. You're just like on a big merry-go-round and you're going round. And the life without Christ it doesn't really have a purpose. It's just an existence. And what the Lord wants me to share in this service tonight, I want to speak about the contemplation of life. The contemplation of life. Twice in this chapter, the Lord says very clearly, very distinctively, very precisely, consider your ways. It's very poignant, isn't it? And it's very personal. This is not for the person beside you tonight that God is speaking to. This is a direct word to your own heart. Consider your ways. And the first thing that God wants to bring to your attention tonight, that life is short. No matter if you live till you're a hundred years old, till you're an octogenarian or whatever they call them, it's short. There's an inscription in a clock in Chester Cathedral in England and it says this, When I was a child, I laughed and wept. Time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. As older still I daily grew, time flew. Soon I shall find when travelling on, time's gone. Will of Christ have saved my life by then. Whenever we're young, it's not what it says. When I was a child, I laughed and wept. And you know, whenever you're a child, you can't wait to, to grow up. You can't wait to leave the primary school and get into the bigger school. And when I became a youth, I dreamed and talked. Sure, that takes me back till I was 14, when I was taking the wife out with a hand. Well, I wasn't married when I was 14. <laughs> Salvation's a romance too, did you know that? When I was a youth, I dreamed and thought. Time walked. But when I became a full grown man, time ran. Why is it? It doesn't have shoe on. Huh? When you get two or three years on. If you would have seen me when I was 17, 18 years of age, I had longer hair than Margaret. I had no old hair. Paul my God, I've seen my wagon photograph and he looked at me and he says, you, you haven't seen And he looked at me and he went, he couldn't believe it. When I became a full grown man, time ran. Whenever you get older, it's as if time goes faster. It, it runs away on you. On the older still, I, I, I daily grew, he says, he says, time on. Well, the Andrew says he went to bed one day when he was 16, he woke up, he was 40. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed to go that, that fast. <coughs> and soon I shall find when travelling on, time's gone. I live beside an old man, William Gardner. He was a thatcher of a tree. He's probably a fellow who knows what thatch is. <laughs> but he was a thatcher and William was a good. He told me, give me a bit of wonderful advice as a young boy. And I was curt to the missus. Well, he says, Darn, never marry you a hundred pound in your pocket. Hold it down. I married my daughter there three years ago. I don't want to tell you what it cost. <laughs> but I killed a fat of calf. I did it over. <laughs> Only five. And all, and all, and all two knots 
Consider your lifestyle. Consider your profession of faith as a glorifying to God. Do you spend more time in sport than you do in prayer? Consider your lifestyle. Dear long seated person in this service tonight, consider your ways. Are you happy the way things are going at the moment? <coughs> are you happy with your lifestyle? The barber that I go to, not very often, <laughs> <laughs> we have some great chance. And he's brought up on a Roman Catholic background, I'm from a Protestant background, he was an older boy, he played the organ and so forth. And we have some great chance. And he's up the stage now, he never goes near the place, and he's no interest in God, he's no interest He's really like an atheist now. And you know, he says, Lord, I don't really care much, much about it. Have you any family that I have of two boys? Well, I says, that attitude of yours is great. But everything's going well. But when trouble comes, who will you turn to? See, it's all right saying, I have no interest in, in God or the things of God. But whenever it might be the cancerous tumor comes. Or three or four stone drops off your body and, and something into your body. It's a different attitude then. Mm -hmm. And God would say to me, consider your ways. Are you happy with your life? Are you happy where you're, how, how things are going for you at the moment? These are days of deep depression and, and crowd crunch and people are crying out for help. Do you know that a preached here, I think it was the first Monday night, be sure your sin will find you out. And as a result of the sin of man, the crowd crunch has come. But rather than Raven had prophesied, the crowd crunch in America ten years before it that happened. God said it was coming. And the financial world was torn into turmoil overnight. <coughs> oh, you'll consider your bank account overnight. And you'll consider your will. But will you consider about your soul? Are you happy with your lifestyle? Just the mundane, just the routine, work, home, we better pleasure, work, home, there's more to life. God just didn't let you come into this world to work. You're in, into this world to find him. And that's why the Lord would say to you tonight, consider your ways. 
Maybe you've come to the service and you've never thought about where you stand before God tonight. But God will also say to you, consider your mother. How are you walking as a Christian? You see, the same call that came to Abraham was the same call that comes to every Christian. And God said to Abraham in Genesis 17 and 1, He says, Walk thee before me and be thee perfect. Now, it's not perfect in the sense that you'll never sin. It's a blameless walk. In other words, a right heart and a right attitude walking before God. He said to Abraham, He said, Walk before me. And then he says, walk beside me. And then he says, walk behind me. This, this gracious relationship. But what's how you walk tonight, dear child of God? Are you in a close place with the Lord? Or are you like Peter? He was walking afar off. Whosoever covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. Shall not prosper. God gives him tell lies, dear believer. It says in Ecclesiastes 3 and 15. God requireth that which is past. You see all these murderers in the land and people that are now places of authority and have the rule over us who have blood on their hands. And I am not into politics, but God will require that. Every murder that happened in this province, every rape, every child abuse. God will require that which is past. Tony Blair and his cronies and all of them can get, do whatever they want and wipe the slate clean and start again. That's man's method, but that's not God's. God says, I require that which is past. You're accountable to God from the moment you begin of understanding to the moment you die. Whether you're saved or unsaved, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Romans 14 and 12. God says, consider your future. <coughs> You have a future tonight. And I trust and pray you have a long future here on earth to live for the glory of God and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But you also have a future in eternity. You will spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven with Christ or in hell without Him. God says, consider your future. The book of Hebrews chapter 9, 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die. You die once here. But after this, there's an afterlife. But after this, the judgment. 
judgment. Judgment for what? Well, this scripture will be fulfilled in, two, in a twofold way. First of all, the Christian will be judged of the Bema Seed judgment according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Where we as Christians will give an account of our service to God. We will not be judged for sin because that, that judgment for sin is over for us when we trusted Christ as our Savior. We, don't, we are not judged for sin. We will be judged for service. Christian, are you serving Christ? Because you're going to give an account of the judgment seat of Christ for how you lived your life for Him. And if you have been living a deceitful life, it will be exposed there. It's called the great day of exposure for the believer. Just like everything's hidden in the camera roll, and nobody can see what's in it, but the day comes when it's on fair and unknown road and God will expose all that's there. That's why it's important to be filled with the Holy Spirit and live a life that will glorify God. <coughs> but for the unseen, your future, your future day will be of the great white throne judgment when you be judged as a sinner because you've rejected grace and salvation and forgiveness here. And the reasons why you should consider your future is this, because of the multitude of sin that is behind you. Not only were you born a sinner, but all the sins you committed must be judged. So there's a multitude of sin behind you, and there is an angry God above you. God says he is angry with the wicked. Every day. Every day. And the only reason that God's anger and wrath is not unleashed in this world is because of his grace in Christ Jesus. And he's withholding his day of wrath. So there's a multitude of sin behind you. There's an angry God above you. And there's the great white throne of judgment ahead of you. Where you will be judged for all your sin. And dear friend, worst of all, there's a lake of fire for you. If you don't repent. A lake of fire for you, dear unsaved friend tonight. And you know something tonight? Hell was never made for any of you. Did you know that? Hell was made for the devil and his angels. But all who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and reject the grace of God in Christ and the salvation of the churches of the place of Calvary, to reject the grace and mercy of God. You must face the judgment and wrath of God. You cannot have both. You're either in or out. You can't say the fact. And this is why God would say to you now, dear friend, consider the future. Your future. Where will you spend eternity? Where are you going to spend eternity when you die? And God would say to you tonight as well, listen, consider your family. Consider that we precious family that, that God has given to you. <coughs> where are you taking? Come on, Dad, tonight. Be honest. Where are you taking that son of yours? If he follows your example, will you take him to the public house? Will you take him in deeper into sin? You want to be a guiding influence and you want to be moral and upright. But you need to say, son, son, don't do what I say. Do what I do. <coughs> when you bring them to church on a Sunday morning. Does he hear you, does he hear you in the bedroom praying? Could, could he find you on your knees? <coughs> Are you living by example or are you just living by, by living? 
van sin bevang. That is one of the great blessings of this mission. But I have seen mothers who, who, who put their family before themselves and knew the greatest thing they could do was, was to give their life to Christ. And I have the joy here of, of kneeling beside moms who in repentance have, have called on God to save them. Because not only did they consider their family, they were considering their own souls as well. And the Lord says to me, consider your family, consider them your children. Oh, God says, consider your ways to me, listen, consider your health. Consider your health. Do you know what about, about a health is, dear old saint person to me? It's God's alarm clock. It's God's alarm clock to your soul. And he's ringing in your ear. And if you have a bout of bad health tonight, whatever it is, listen, it's God's wake up call for you. He's speaking loud into your spirit, telling you, he's giving you this thing. The talk about it was a wee scare. There's nothing we about it. It's a big scare. It's a big wake up call. Mm -hmm. There was a dear man here, sure didn't, didn't um, our brother said. He was sitting in the, in the meeting here the other night. And in the middle of the night he, he took a heart attack. Sure he could have been in the presence of the Lord because he's saying, thank God he's ready to go. And the doctor said, it's a wee warning to you now. Dear friend, when, when God in his mercy let sickness come into your life, it's his alarm clock, it's his wake-up call to your soul. <coughs> Many someone doesn't get the rattle. I have known people, and all of a sudden, bang! I used to drink the boys in, in the local pub in Berlin. And every Thursday night we were a man. And this fellow loved, he loved more than making the stand of cigarettes at our school. <coughs> he loved nothing more, he wasn't, didn't smoke cigarettes, but he loved nothing more than a half of whiskey, a bottle of beer, and a big cassette to hurt his head. One of big brown. The fire will end the fruit of the law. And we had some crack. And his wife was a fine Christian. And she was out at her church every Sunday morning. She was out in her prayer meeting. Um, and he would have come to a long church meeting to see. Because he, he wasn't against God. And he wasn't against the gospel, but he wouldn't, he just, he just wasn't considering his ways. Just like maybe some of you, half the mission's all right for the wife. I'll go and make the place. Maybe you're just here to make the place the wife, are you? Hmm. You'll get a good breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but God is using that. On time, we, Thursday night, great crap. What was part of it? He went to his work, coming to another farm, on Friday morning. And he went round the corner, and a big lorry had him, out into eternity. Straight out into eternity. And as far as I know, I'm not his judge. He never got the right with God. Proverbs 9 and 10, the 
fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And by Him, thy days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. The fear of God brings God life into your soul. Honor <coughs> your father and your mother and you live long on the earth. Do you want to live long? Live for God. Consider your health tonight. Could God's alarm clock be ringing in your ear because of your health? You could be like that wee man that told you about the other night when he got the cancer. When he got gloriously saved as a result of it, and he said, Thank God for the cancer because it brought him to Christ. You heard Johnny Wedlock's testimony here last night. He fell 15 feet from a roof and hit his head on the concrete floor and was in a coma for four weeks and they took the top of the skull off and they let the brain swell. Paul was telling me this morning, but he didn't say it. They resuscitated him twice in the ambulance. And he said here last night, it was a blessing. God turned it into a blessing. He's living a very close life for God now. He was back soon. Went out to work, an ordinary day, and all of a sudden put his foot in the sheet of tin, down he went, 15 feet onto his head, multiple brain injuries. The doctors couldn't understand how he's alive, but his mother and father were praying people. Consider your hands tonight in the light of what God is doing. But, dear friend, there's more than your hands at stake tonight, and this is what God is looking after. He says, Consider your soul. Consider your soul. You see, your soul is the real you. And your soul lasts as well as God lasts. Your soul is immortal. Your soul is everlasting. Don't you think when you die that it's annihilation or extinction or obliteration or reincarnation? If that we woman that died there a few years ago, she said she was coming back as a bee. A bee? <laughs> Our glory of only for looking for feathers for Carol. Catch yourself on. <coughs> You'll grasp by the name only the last one. Consider your soul tonight because it lives on somewhere. And the Bible says that soul that sinneth it shall die. <coughs> you die in hell. <coughs> Tormented forever. Because in hell there's no real life. Just torment. The rich man says, Send Lazarus and let him, let him just get one wee drop of water and put it in my tongue. He says, For I am tormented. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your soul because 
so precious to God. If God wanted me to be in hell, he never would have come to me from the, from the pit of the grave. If, if God hated you tonight, he never would have sent Christ to, to die in Calvary and shed his precious blood. God takes no pleasure in the death of anyone. But his desire is that all would come to repentance tonight. God says, consider your ways. Consider your soul. But friend, listen. Consider your eternal destiny. Are you sure tonight where you're going after you die? Are you absolutely sure where you'll be one second after you die? Because the moment that the last breath goes out of your body, and this is the way my father died when the, when the, when the, the death veil come down over him. Just one. Sending the angels for you <coughs> to bury you through the darkness of death, that old, that horrible valley, into the glory land. The Bible says, absent from the body, but present with the Lord. Have you considered your destiny to me? Were you? Job 14 says, But man dieth and wasteth away. The body wastes away at rots. Yea, man giveth up the ghost. And where is he? Where is all them people? And you stood around the graveside. And looked into the, into the grave. That's what Job says. Where are they? You see, the ground <coughs> will take the body, and either heaven or hell will take your soul. But, friends, where I quickly tonight, God will say to you, Come, sit down. Consider him tonight. Wherefore, we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, all those that are saved. Let us consider him, the Lord Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the majesty of man. Have you ever considered Have you ever really considered what the Lord Jesus has done for you? He died for you on the cross. He loves you with an everlasting love and he desires that, that you will be saved. Oh, consider him to me. Consider him to me. Consider his death for you. This is not a Jack and Lori 
the story. This is the reality. The Son of God died on Calvary's cross over 2,000 years to redeem your soul from hell. And it was your sin that placed him there. It wasn't the Jews that just crucified him, you know. He, all men crucified him for all have sinned. And your sin was led upon him. For if the Bible says, forget when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one day, one die, but peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, being reconciled by him, shall we be saved through his blood? He died for you. Why do you only have a sinner? Consider his death for you. Consider his suffering. Consider his punishment. Consider the shame and the nakedness of the cross. Consider his afflictions and all he went through to redeem your soul from hell. And as we preached here last night about the love of God for you. How much he loves you. Oh, Satan will not tell you that. Satan will tell you if you got saved, your life would be miserable and you wouldn't go back to the pub and you couldn't have another cigarette and, and, would, and, and, and all the joy would go into your life. He's only a liar. The Bible says he's the father of lies. It says in John 10 there, Jesus says, the devil come but for to steal, to kill and to destroy your life. But Jesus says, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, abundant life. There's more to life, of course there is. It's when you have Christ in your life, then you have real life. If you don't have Christ, you've only got existence. Meaningless, vanity. <coughs> Consider his resurrection for you. <coughs> Do you know that our Christian faith is built on an empty tomb? You can go look at these rabbis and they're land and state. Marxism and reincarnation and Buddha temples. You'll not find my Jesus in no tomb. Up from the grave here, he arose all right. With a mighty triumph for his foes. And the Christian message of the gospel is built on the empty tomb, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive tonight, and he's alive in the power of an endless life. And do you know how he lives? Because I'm in here. He lives in me. I feel his presence every day. I feel the anointing of his Holy Spirit in my life. He's more real to me than you. I can hear on his bells and you can hear the words. Don't you tell me he's not alive. I have the experience of life. <coughs> On the 24th of March 1989, when I bowed my knees and trusted Christ as my Saviour and brought him into my life, he became a reality. Not a figment of, of the imagination. He's really alive. He arose from the grave. He's out of that tomb now and he's seated at the Father's right hand, a Prince and a Saviour, and someday he's coming again soon. And he's not coming back for the manger, you know. He's not coming back as a wee baby. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's coming back to pour out his wrath on all them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of his coming and the glory of his power. And it's, as, as they say here in, the, in Ireland, in the north of Ireland, chucky our law, and that'll be his day. God's great day. When he comes in judgment upon sin and sinners and all those who rebel and reject the gospel. And what is the gospel? The good news that Christ came and died for your sins. And you rejected him. You see, the Lord says tonight, consider your ways, but you know what you're saying? You're going your own way. You've got your own ways. You've got your own plans. You've got your own ambitions. Do you know why you're not saved tonight? Christ will crop your lifestyle. He would crop your lifestyle. Because there's sin in your life that you love and you don't want that sin to go. You want to hold on to your sin. You want to live without a doctor's relationship. 
You want to, to stay engaged in that suffering? Or that lesbian relationship? Or you love the horses too much? Or the Greek or the GGs? And because you love your sin more than you love Christ, you're considering yourself tonight. And you're not considering your soul, you're considering your lifestyle. But that's not what the Bible says. It says, consider your ways. In the light of God, in the light of eternity. Where are you going to be, dear friend? Oh, consider him. Says the word of God. Consider the provision of the blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that takes away sin. You need to go and climb any mountain, for you'll find no forgiveness but have it. Or you need to go and dip yourself seven times in some, some lake somewhere, because it'll not take your sin away. And I don't care how much money you pay into the church, it'll never cover your sin. Frank Sinatra gave the Pope one million dollars to pay his soul through purgatory. He may as well flip the fire. If you could bring Frank back now, I tell you, out of blue eyes. He wouldn't be singing New York, New York. I'll tell you that. He'd be singing a different song. He'd be singing Flee from the Wrath to Come. Oh, friends, listen, this is a serious message. Why is it serious? Because it's your eternal destiny. It's not mine, mine's safe. This is yours. That's why God says, consider your ways. Consider the provision of the blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. If Christ wouldn't have shed his blood on the cross for you, there would be no forgiveness. Did you know that? And Jesus cried from the cross, finish. The work's done. And then the churches want to add to it. Well, you've got to be confirmed. You've got to be christened. You've got to be baptized. You've got to pay into the church. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to do it. Jesus says, it's finished. And I kind of not I don't have any, any qualifications, but I know this. I'm not that stupid. If the thing is finished, it's finished. Paid the price for my sin, it's paid. And I don't need no bond to tell me not. Because I can read it in the Word of God. It's finished. Consider his will for you. He loves you tonight. He loves you more than you are. To love for you. He wants to see you. He wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. He wants to give you a future. Like any good father. I'm a father. I have children. And it's my heart's desire to bless my children. <coughs> and what good person would want the best of children? <coughs> God wants to bless his. But he can't bless you tonight because you're not his child. God only becomes your father when you become his son. <coughs> and that happens when you trust Jesus as your saviour. God tonight's not your father. Even though you've been brought up in the church to say our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's not. God is your creator. He becomes your father when, when Christ becomes your saviour. Not until then. I'll consider his love for you tonight. He has made every provision for the salvation of your soul. Everything you need tonight, listen, it's not in the what is that fancy word you use? Suave. It's in Christ. Everything you need to make some Christ. You see that illness you have, Christ can cure that. See that cancer is you have, Christ can cure that if he wants to. 
And many of you are seeking for cures. We're looking around for a charm here and a charm there. If you've ever been charmed, you know what you've brought on your life a curse. Did you know that? And if you're a Christian have ever been charmed, you need to repent of that before God because it's holding you back in your Christian walk. And get shot by you. <coughs> the only one who... And listen, people said to me, charms work. You're dead right to me. The devil can charm you inside out and you can, and the, you can have a demonic healing. But you pay a spiritual price. You see, you know what will happen when you, when you go for the charm? For the old cows or the sheep or the ringworm or whatever, and you get the healing. Do you know what's happening? The devil's coming back someday for his wages. He gives nothing for you. You see, God gives gifts, the devil pays wages. He'd be coming back for that demonic healing you receive. Christ can heal you in that church. Should then a prosperity preacher from the television send in your money and we'll say a wee prayer and all as well. Whew. They have a lot to answer for. <coughs> you notice in here there's no collections. Gospel's free. It's free. We're not looking your money. And I didn't come here for money either. I come here to preach the word of God and to warn you people to flee from the wrath to come. And to tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you and died on the cross for you and he's not willing for any of you to perish. And if you think I'm hard on you, God help you. What do you see when the judgment day comes? I'm not being hard on you. I'm being honest with you. I'm your best friend tonight, believe it or not, because I'm telling you truth. You may not like it, but at least you'll appreciate it. If your wee son was going to school with a school teacher said, now missus, you know, this wee boy of yours is not just as good as you think he is, but if you put these few wee things right, you know, he can improve. You're not going to hear that, but at least you'll take an advice and you'll do something about it. And when the preacher comes to tell you about your son, you'll do absolutely nothing. Consider his love for you. Consider his blessings. No, God has blessed you tonight, dear own saved person. See every good thing you have that come from God. The Bible says every good gift, every perfect gift, come from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, it doesn't vary, neither shadow of time, but comes from God. And the Bible says the very goodness of God should lead you to repentance. Because he's so good. Maybe you think God's hard on you. As I said on another night, with bad health, you'll be back there limping into heaven with one leg. Like the one in the head locked into hell with perfect health. The contemplation of life. Consider 